political pressure, sensitivity. I can be truthful, I can write what I want. And interestingly, um, writing in English also freed me, literally, because English is not my native tongue. So I can be adventurous. Um, we can talk about that a bit later. So uh, that's the reason I decided to write in English. The second question is, uh, I know I have I come from a journalist background, and I writ, published uh, a few non-fiction books. Why did I launch, uh, why did I write uh, fiction? In fact, this is a question I asked myself hundreds of times. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I want to be just honest with you. Um, um, Lotus is my debut novel, and I, it did not come about easily. And I think coming from a journalist background, uh, writing nonfiction come more naturally to me. Uh, and uh, um, I find that you know there's there's such an incredible freedom to write fiction. Right? You can make up anything. You can. You can create any character, you want the character to die, the character will die instantly. But uh, there's also, um, I found that freedom extremely intimidating because you have to create a believable world and the emotions have to be, you know, emotion <laughs> be emotionally true. Um, anyway, so I, I really struggled uh, with the book, but in the end, I'm, I'm pleased I've done it. The reason I wanted to launch the fiction project, because I thought maybe I, I was wrong, and I thought um, fiction, perhaps in some ways, the finer form of literature. And uh, when I was in my younger years, when I was still struggling in the factory, I've written some, I, I, I did write some short stories. So anyway, so... The <laughs> so that's a very interesting turning. Well, we are two um, ethnical, ethically, ethnically Chinese people talking here in English. Um, and I think that's very interesting because um, yesterday you also mentioned that another language actually creates a different personality. I think uh, that is also one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest reasons you choose to write in a foreign tongue. Well, for people who uh, who were not here yesterday, yesterday's session was about uh, seeing China from inside China and outside China, and I talk about how I benefited from English. I started teaching myself English when I was in the factory, and then looking back, I'm learning English changed my life. Um, because what I learned, it broadened my horizon. What I learned was not just ABC, but the whole cultural p package. And it really greatly broadened my horizon and in some ways gave me my uh, rice ball, fan um, Now I'm making a living from, from writing. And I find it so interesting that, um, you know, speaking different language bring up different aspects uh, of my personality. Um, I, I'm always very conscious of a factory worker, so when I'm learning English, I. I, I listen to BBC obsessively. I try to speak with proper accent. <laughs> try to pretending to be sophisticated. <laughs> but when I speak Chinese, I speak, I speak um, without realizing, I speak much louder, faster. And <laughs> I just in a natural way, I don't, my Chinese, I don't sound uh, educated or polished. <laughs> I think to a certain extent, learning a foreign language allows you a fresh start. You can create another uh, self -image. Yes, indeed. The first Roman Empire uh, famously said, when you um, gain a new language, you gain a new soul. I don't know if I got a new soul, but anyway, <laughs> in some ways, it feels like a reborn. Yeah. Okay, uh, back to the novel Lotus. Well, it's a, a novel about sex workers in a very famous city of China, Shenzhen, and you call it the city of sins. I want to ask, why do you choose to write about sex workers? We know that in traditional Chinese literature, there are indeed many literary works about prostitutes, and they are often portrayed as those, um, those um, very miserable women who were forced into the sex industry and who uh, is willing to sacrifice themselves to contribute to the male masters. And uh, what do you think uh, is there a difference between the um, prostitutes in traditional Chinese literature and the prostitutes in your own novel? 
That's a very interesting question, a good question. I think I should explain a little bit of the background. For the, in China, for, um, throughout the centuries, you know, women, uh, uh, you know, uh, what dominated in Chinese society was the Confucius uh, ideology, so which placed women in an inferior uh, position, and was also women could not just go out and, and socialize. So the um, prostitutes, the poems we read about, if you want to read my book, there's some poems uh, you will learn. They are, you know, they... They have written by literatis, uh, middle up class men, often powerful men, because uh, for those kind of people, the only way to have elegant company was prostitutes. But those prostitutes are not normal women. They, they, they were trained, they, they can write calligraphy, they can recite poetry, um, and some of them become very influential. So they are quite different. I mean, in, in today's China, the people I, um, those uh, sex workers are right about they are from really middle low class establishment which make up the huge prostitution army and to answer your first question why um, why I wanted to choose this subject um, my grandmother I was brought up my, my, by my grandmother she was an extraordinary woman and um, my father had another job my mother uh, worked full time, so my sister and I and my brother were brought up by my grandmother, who was an extremely kind and loving woman. And in 1998, shortly uh, in front of her deathbed, I learned a long-kept family history uh, secret that my grandmother was a prostitute in her youth. And I, I was shocked because you don't associate your grandmother with a prostitute. And then my mother explained that my grandmother uh, become orphan at the age of six, and then she was adopted by her aunt, who treated her like a slave. And then she, when she blossomed into a beautiful young woman at age 13, 14, she was sold into a brothel. I mean, those days, women were treated like common commodity. So she, for 10 years, my grandma worked at this brothel, middle-range place called Trinjanlo, pavilion of uh, spring Green fragrance, fragrance. You know, its front always lit up by red lanterns. So she actually met my grandfather on the job. My grandfather was a small time grand dealer and he was very smitten with my grandmother and he bought her out and installed her as a concubine. And, and in 1949, after the Chinese Communist Party took over, uh, men were ordered to have one wife, so he decided to stay with my grandmother. So for, for that reason, my grandmother was very grateful to the Chinese Communist Party and to Chairman Mao. So, I, so I, ever since this discovery, I became obsessed, I became interested in uh, prostitution as I tried to imagine um, what my grandma's life was like, you know, uh, living in, this, uh, in the brothel and how, what kept her going. And then just a few months after that, I went to, I worked as a journalist, I went to Shenzhen uh, on a reporting trip. Um, so I went to a hair salon, I got curly hair when it's uh, humid, it's gone, just gone wild, so I, I wanted to get my hair cut. And there were in this, I went to this, I didn't think very much, and uh, there were a few girls there wearing uh, very uh, low-cut dresses. Uh, and they said, they were giggling, they said, sorry, we didn't know how to cut hair. <laughs> it's a hairdresser, you don't know how to cut, cut, cut one's hair. I looked down the, um, on the floor, there was no hair shavings, and suddenly it clicked what kind of establishment it was. So I, I chatted with the girls, and they, um, they all coming from, you know, poor hinterland of China, you know, Honan, Hubei, that sort of area. They were poorly educated, and some of them got jobs at a migrant worker um, at, on the production line. And so, and I thought, yes, it's quite a prostitution, that, you know, um, it's an interesting a window to see the social change because it touches up on some of the most important issues China facing today, migration, rural-urban divide, the growing gender gap between men and women, and, you know, moral decline. All these things are very interesting social issues. So that's how I decided to... So, launched since the project. Yeah. Yes, from family history to your real concern about um, those unheard voices in our society, right? Exactly. I actually thought about. Um, I thought a lot about my grandmother. Um, 
And I, um, I, I tried to interview my mother about my grandma's life when she really didn't know very much. So I sort of bought writing a fictional like, account of her life. Um, but then I just thought, of, why don't I just write um, um, about what's happening now in China, in the, the social tension brought by the reform. So that's, um, yeah. that's why. <laughs> but just now you mentioned your grandmother was very grateful for the Communist Party, for yeah. the uh, PRC. But mm. um, actually, after the founding of the PRC, uh, prostitution effectively became banned, right? Yes, yes So that's correct. a whole um, illegal <coughs> industry out there. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. So after, in 1949, after, uh, after the Mao Communist Party took over, brothels were all closed, and uh, <coughs> prostitutes were reformed or married off. Um, so for, for a while, it looked like in that kind of uh, the, huge, the oldest human trade was wiped from the face of earth. And then in the reform era, uh, with growing wealth, with relaxed social control, and uh, with a mobile population, many migrant workers left. The village come to city to work. They, they, they don't always bring their family. And also just, you know, this growing hedonistic tendency. So the, all these things contributed to the growth of uh, um, sex industry in China. And of, of course, there has been a, a sexual revolution. <laughs> yes, I think in your book, there is actually a very strange uh, relationship between the police and the, the prostitutes, right? There's a strange kind of a coexistence. They are like conspirators. So on the surface, prostitution is illegal. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. uh, in fact, in reality, I think uh, statistics show that uh, an estimated amount of uh, about 10 million people. 10 million, yes. I've spoken to experts. I mean, it's very difficult to tell uh, num the num precise number, but uh, um, something like 10 million um, workers. And we call them, um, you know, the, the red, <laughs> like the red, you know, have, there's a famous uh, um, Bali called the uh, red detachment of women. So they call that the yellow detachment of women. Yellow, that's the word, byword for pornography and the sex industry in China. Yes. Uh, back to the book. In the book, many characters have encountered uh, various kinds of difficulties. Some are very specific to their profession. But do you think um, there are other difficulties that are common to all women in China or in other countries? And I think, uh, I think uh, right now, when I want to, I want this, you know, I'm coming from journalist background, and this book is really kind of a social critique. Um, I, I think that Deng Xiaoping's reforms and opening up have brought a huge benefits and opportunities to both men and women, and particularly educated urban women. But also, unfortunately, I would say that uh, market economy also undermined gender equality, because as China transformed from planned economy to the market, market economy, women have shouldered too much of the burden and the cost. For example, when the state-owned let off workers, uh, women always the first to be let off, and far more women to be let off. And once they're let off, very difficult for them to fund reemployment. The gender pay gap is also widening. So I think that's because of that, that drove some of the most vulnerable women to take up the fresh trade. I mentioned the story of my grandmother. She was sold into prostitution, and from what I know, most women working in China, they enter the trade on their free will, but often forced by some circumstances, led off workers or the victim of domestic violence, uh, some are dumped by a husband. So there's, um, and also, as you know, there's a very thin, um, there's very little social uh, safety net. So once there's something going wrong, Yes, the, the uh, if official discourse actually labels those prostitutes as shizu fu nu, woman gone astray. So uh, to a certain extent, that ref reflects the government's opinion on uh, those sex workers. That's exactly, that's, I think in China, there's, it has, it's even for academics, I, I send you, I'm sure you know that, it's very difficult for them to research on prostitution properly, and it's because it's sensitive. And suppose, for example, um, somebody wants you to uh, turn my, the novel into a, 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 a film, and he pitched it at a high-level meeting, and he was told, sorry, 
prostitution doesn't exist in China. So that just shows how it is still uh, uh, you know, a, a sensitive area. Yes. Um, and about the uh, female characters you uh, depicted in this book, they have all kinds of um, setbacks in their own relationships. Right. I think uh, for um, these relationship problems, it's actually quite representative, right? For a relationship to work, you don't only need affection, you don't only need uh, appreciation. There are many other factors that people will take into account. For example, <coughs> your personal history, right? Mm -hmm. When a prostitute want to give up that trait and become a good person, we say, commit to goodness, tong liang, right? Um, but uh, that way, not necessarily will go well. What do you think of uh, this problem? Um, <clears throat> I think some women I know um, have managed to got out of the life. And back on your earlier question, how there so many, I mean, one, one thing struck me, I, oh, by the way, I, I, I did lots of interviews and also I worked for NGO. So I spent quite a lot of, a lot of time hanging out with sex workers, but I'm keenly aware um, you know, my um, urban, privileged, middle-class existence is very different from um, a low-grade uh, sex worker. So I, I, I know I have to do uh, good research. One thing that really struck me was that some women have such powerful longing for, to have a boyfriend. And some of them actually pay money to keep their... Um, so-called boyfriend, and some of them, they're just xiaobaiyan, uh, chibaifan, they were living off those women. And then I understand, because um, there's so much fake intimacy in a, you know, um, in, a, in, a, in a transition, sexual transition, so they have this longing for some genuine affection. So even though, in a way, there's some of those uh, so-called boyfriend, you know, waste their money, and they have their mistress on the side, and, Yes, although they have much physical intimacy, what they really want is emotional intimacy. Yes. Yes, yes. all right. Um, uh, next question is about, oh, very interesting, well, Esther, you also mentioned that um, some people would confuse you with Leslie Chang, yeah. who famously <laughs> wrote the, uh, the book Factory Girls, yes, well, because yeah, you yeah. were formerly a factory girl. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. I also find a strange... Um, relationship between factory girls and prostitutes because many of the prostitutes were originally working as factory girls. Yes, that's correct. I've, I've done lots of um, interviews and some of the girl uh, sex workers, they worked as um, on the production line and the pay was very low and the, very, the work was very hard, very boring. So one of the colleagues got a job working at a massage parlor and the pay was much better. So they, that's how they... And of course, there's a temptation of money, I know. Yes, so okay. the um, labor force uh, actually, um, well, the uh, descension into prostitution actually has something to do with the thin safety net you just mentioned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, um, can you describe, well, because the topic of this session is women in contemporary China, well, can you describe in one or two sentences about the um, women's status, their conditions, their living conditions or their working conditions in contemporary China? Uh, perhaps I could share with you, I, I, I've already started, uh, I'm going to tell you the story of the woman in our family. Um, I mentioned the story of my grandmother. So she's very much the product of her generation. You know, she was illiterate, she had a bounded feet. Um, in 1949, when the Chinese Communist Party took over, about less than 10% of women uh, were literate. So my grandmother learned to how to write her letter, not her own name, at the anti-illiteracy campaign launched by the government. Um, and, um, you know, she, my grandmother was brought up, you know, for women of that generation. And, you know, she lived her life for other people. You know, for example, when our family, we would sit down for dinner. My grandmother would cook. She would never sit down with us. And she kind of treated herself, uh, regarded herself as a servant. Uh, also, I think she, uh, I, I think a lot about my grandmother. I think she, as I, especially as I grew older, I appreciate her quality. You know, I think she 
has this amazing quality of the woman of her generation, older generation women, who had this extraordinary ability to take suffering without bitterness. And you know, she went through you know, the rape of Nanjing, she was often, she was a prostitute, you know, and uh, you know, later her, uh, my grandfather committed suicide because he, was, uh, he didn't come from a political correct background. So my grandma still, towards the end of her life, and she kept saying how lucky she was. Um, and then I think my mother felt better. My mother was born in 1937, and in, she was 12 years old when the new China was founded. And she really welcomed this uh, change because uh, the Chinese Communist Party brought so much hope to the country. And the first law introduced by uh, the Chinese Communist Party was the marriage law. It was not just about marriage. Uh, and it, it abolished all the feudal practice of keeping concubine, child marriage, um, you know, foot binding, and uh, granted the women the equal rights to employment and uh, education. And uh, my mother was assigned a job. Um, in those days, we were in, the, in the urban area, where people were uh, assigned jobs by the government. And she was, my mother felt very lucky that she uh, got a job uh, working at this uh, uh, state-owned enterprise. Among other products, my factory um, produced intercontinental missiles that were capable of reaching North America. <laughs> Anybody from North America here? Not. But anyway, um, all right, okay. <laughs> Welcome. We are friends. Um, so, you know, my mother and her job, she actually more or less did one type of job, which was ethic pickling, uh, involving lifting big machine parts to uh, a tank filled with chemicals. Um, it was very much a man's job, but the Chairman Mao's idea of gender equality was to deny the physical difference between men and women. I mean, you know, at that time, the model women were the, and the, the, were the model women, from the Iron Maiden from Dajie. They looked like a man, they dressed like a man, they could carry as much as a night saw as, as, as men. Chairman Mao famously said, uh, you know, women can hold up half the sky. So for women of my mother's generation, they were regarded as liberated generation because the Chinese communists believed the Marxist theory that only by participating in production could a woman achieve uh, real equality. I mean, at home, still, I know women, my mother did far more housework than my father. Um, so I started my life as a factory worker and I hated my life, so I taught myself English. Um, and it was uh, really a slow, painful process. <laughs> yes, a female so, worker um, would be unthinkable uh, before 1949, mm, but yes, uh, after. Yeah. PRC, well, more and more female um, will um, become engaged in labor work. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. the uh, labor participation rates of female workers in China uh, can be almost 70%. And some people would argue that that's a sign of, uh, that's a measurement of gender equality, they say that. It is, but, uh, but un unfortunately I mentioned the, the setback brought by reforms, but the, um, the labor participation of women who work, actually uh, the percentage dropped. Yes, yeah. I think that's one um, of the alarming facts in recent years because of the um, second childbirth uh, policy, and some people are even discussing about the third child uh, policy. And some people are worried about the possibility of uh, this policy. Well, well, this policy might harm people, uh, women's employability in the labor market. It is. I'm, I'm writing a piece, a piece for the New York Times in the form of a radio, which should come out on April 23rd, about uh, uh, gender discrimination in employment. Um, it is true because. Uh, I think uh, the, one of the problem is, uh, one of the main problem is that the government retreated its responsibility before the jobs were signed. But now, you know, it's up to uh, each company. And female graduates have much ha harder time in finding employment. Um, you know, some companies would uh, just refuse to hire women of child, um, child bearing age because they don't want to pay for future. Um, maternity leave and with this uh, say, relax of the family planning policy that could be even worse um, which is one of the reason that the 
you know, with relaxed, now women can have second children, but many women choose not to. Yes, because yeah. of practical concerns. Yeah, and that raising a child is, uh, is expensive, but also, that's also in line as a Western country. I and mean, when, uh, when you reach middle class, lots of women, they, they are busy, they want, to have, they want to live for themselves, you know, unlike my grandmother, they live for other people. They want to do something for themselves, and, you know, marriage, they don't see the marriage, having children, that's the only, that's the only way, um, you know, only possibility for them, yeah. And uh, my final question is, uh, what's your projection of the issue of gender equality? Do you think gender equality will improve in the future in China? That's a very complicated, uh, I think it's a bit difficult to summarize in one sentence. Um, I would still, I would want to leave that uh, remark with a positive uh, note. Um, I mentioned there are lots of issues with gender equality in China brought by the reforms and opening up. But on the other hand, I also saw um, increased activism in recent years. Starting in 2012, three young women went to the street dressed up in the uh, blood, uh, splattered wedding gown to protest against uh, um, um, domestic violence. Other people followed the seat, or, for example, uh, protest against the shortage of female toilet, um, against uh, unfair treatment of women in workplace. Um, I mentioned the positive change brought by the Chinese Communist Party. Those changes come from top down, from the government. Um, but those uh, activism come from the bottom, they are spontaneous. So I think uh, that shows the Chinese women, they do not sit there and wait. They, are they have taken the matter into their own hands. Yes, like the uh, Me Too movement in the US, we also have Me Too in China. I wouldn't say that, I, I don't because of the government restriction on uh, civil society and activism. So I do not see there will be a Me Too movement in China. But uh, some women, for example, Luo Xixi from Beihang, the Beijing Aviation uh, University, has bravely spoken out. So, yeah, some other women also spoke out. But uh, probably wouldn't, if without government control, there will be a lot more, uh, you know, there will be... Bit, I think it, it is ultimately yes, yeah. up to every one of us to be a part of the uh, movement to advance gender equality. Ab right? Absolutely, yes. yes. And uh, um, thank you very much. Um, before I open the floor, uh, I'd like to invite Li Jia Zhang to read a few uh, paragraphs from Lotus. Well, it is available at the book fair just in the hallway um, and uh, at a very good price. <laughs> If I do say so myself, it's a good, easy read because I don't know too many complicated and long words. <laughs> uh, I would like to read uh, a thing. Um, she, the uh, Lotus works at uh, Apollo. I should summarize what is the book about. Um, it's a book about uh, a girl from Sichuan, village in Sichuan. Lured by, by the bright light, she comes to the Shenzhen to work. Of course, things have gone wrong, otherwise there's no story. And, um, and there's two characters. One is uh, this young migrant worker turned prostitute, and otherwise a photographer who is obsessed in photographing prostitutes. And apart from the official reason he wants to give the voice, those don't have a voice. There's also a private reason, hope you'll find out. And uh, this is also a love story. Uh, by the way, this is not a Chinese version of The Pretty Woman, a film I don't like that much. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's just a fantasy in real life. Things don't happen like that. Um, anyway, for me, this is a book about, you know, as I mentioned about social tension. Also, uh, it's a book about uh, a young woman, uh, her journey of finding herself. And she works uh, a massage parlor, and she has a colleague. One of them is an older woman, and she goes into the flash trade because she has to pay for her son's expensive uh, medical care. As the evening deepens, the street becomes livelier. Three-wheeled vehicles and the motorbikes rattled by, stirring up dust on the narrow, worn-out roads. Peddlers 
selling ice lollies, pineapple on sticks, and meals in boxes, shouted to passers-by. In the distance, a train rumbled along towards the nearby East Station, where slow trains stopped en route to neighboring provinces. Every day, trains brought in more migrant workers from the poor interior. Most of them would end up at construction sites or factories. Sing-song invitations floated up from the girls on the street. Big brother, massage, massage, cheap, cheap. Come here, we have pretty juicy girls and the best massage in town. The word massage always come out in three long, caressing syllables. Massage. Lotus spotted two tall men in their thirties, dressed in suits and ties, strutting along the street. No wonder the girls were calling out so loudly. They were a better catch than the usual small fry. Pulling down the padded bra that forever rolled up her flat chest, Sha leaped up onto the road and seized the men by their wrists. Come, big brother, this way. Good service, any service you like. The thinner and the taller of the two men who looked like a scarecrow, shoveled her way with a chuckle. Big brother, you think you are younger than us, ha? Huh? Xia's heavily made up face hardly changed color as she followed the men. Brothers, haven't you heard the saying, old ginger is hotter? <laughs> yes, thank you very much for a wonderful, a wonderful written novel. Uh, next, we'll give the floor to the audience. If you have any questions about writing, about language learning, or about rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no nuclear six scientist. <laughs> By the way, the prostitution is illegal in China. Every aspect of the prostitution, from buying, selling, consensual sex trades, or illegal, unlike in Macau and Hong Kong. Any questions? And I've just been voted together with Leslie, the factory with girls, one of the best books, six best books on women in China. Wow. Mm -hmm. So another connection between you and Leslie. <laughs> okay. Hi. So I wanted to ask a little more if you could talk more about some of the cultural and political barriers to gender equality in China. I know you mentioned the restrictions on civil society um, and the limits that has on change. And do you have any other ideas on that? Um, uh, one, of the, one of the problems, uh, one of the China lags behind in political participation. And, you know, in the low level, the, in the village, the head of village now is are, are voted, but for the moment, the only two, three percent women um, head of the village are women, are women, because um, there's still lots of a misconception. One of the traditional belief is, uh, in a woman should a student, decent woman should not take interest outside the family, and they also have a saying that women have long hair, short wisdom. Uh, and also, if you look at the, China just had this uh, National People's Congress. Have you noticed the higher level you go, the less women. So we have the National People's Congress. So now the 20, about 22, just over 22% are women. The Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, about 15.8% are women. The next of the minister, there are two ministers, and the Standing Committee, seven, boy or boys club. So that's the issue. Um, and also, um, unfortunately, you know, civil society and normal play a, a big role in pushing for gender equality. Unfortunately, that's the area that's uh, very difficult. Um, the government does want to implement gender equality. They want to set their own gender. They want doing their own pace and talking about things that feel comfortable. You know, you know that uh, three years ago, five young families plan to go to the street to protest against uh, sexual harassment in public places, but they were arrested. So I'll just give you an uh, example. Yes. I think one of the activists actually from uh, the same university as I am, and 
the news about that arrest is completely banned on the internet. Yeah. Right. And I think for that question, I would like to add that the officials, the government, doesn't seem to show much concern about gender equality. I think um, in the People's Congress session held just several days before, um, one of the representatives actually had a bill about the sexism of, of the People's Congress because if you see, if you look at the list of participants, the list of representatives, they will have a pair of brackets indicating this is a female representative. Mm -hmm. No, right. Uh, so I think on the higher level there isn't much concern and if you want to make any progress it would probably be bottom up. Right. Any other questions? Well. <笑>不好意思我英文不好可以用中文提问吗没关系我的中文很棒 <笑>发表说对于中国女权的一个反省形式我先说中文,要不再来。I uh, think uh, if you don't have earpieces with you, I would like to briefly translate your question. Um, just now, uh, just now, uh, you mentioned about a very famous feminism activist called Ye Hai Yan in China. And she actually, uh, she's kind of a behavioral artist and she voluntarily recorded her, sex, um, her sexual intercourse with migrant workers well, in order to uh, show political awakening or um, feminism awakening. And uh, you were asking about um, Li Jia's opinion on this activist. And she's, yes, I actually met her and I found her a very um, admirable lady, extremely courageous. Uh, she, at one point, she actually had a center for, to help uh, female sex workers in Wuhan, in central China. And uh, she shot a fame uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, there was an incident in Hainan Island where the schoolmaster took several girls to a hotel where he raped them. So she put up a sign and said, uh, Headmaster, if you want to have sex, come to have sex with me. Spare the children. And, and, she, and she's very provocative. And, and she um, and also another thing she's famous thing she did was uh, to offer free sex with migrant workers. Um, so at some she's a slightly contro controversial character, and some people think you know she's wonderful, she's so brave, and some people think this does not half the matter. She um, uh, it, because she's so uh, she's in some ways she inviting trouble because you know after that incident. Um, Hainan schoolmaster's incident, uh, her home was raided by the police and she had a fight with the police and she, very, a physical fight and she injured one of the, um, one of the policemen. But anyway, so she's, uh, I, in, all in all, I would think that uh, I, I just hope, I wish the government would be more relaxed and allow people like her. There's space for, there should be more space for civil society. Okay, I think we have the time for one last question. Okay, thanks for the share. As we talk about the uh, women's rights, that's making me think about the Me Too activity in the Hollywood. And uh, what do you think of the women's rights activities in the all around the world? What's the, what's the future view to development of the women's rights uh, activities? Where does this activity go in? And uh, what do you think about this activity? Because in some uh, uh, social media like Weibo and Twitter, there are some aggressive women's activity right in those social media, as you can see that. And uh, I don't want to judge those activities 
because I'm on the woman's side, that's the woman's activity right is just to echo right. That's what do you think about this topic? Thanks. Are you talking about uh, the um, um, activism in China or the just about the rights in general? Uh, sorry. Your I, question is about the activism or just about uh, women's rights? Just women's rights. Yes, I mean, okay. well, it's more hopeful. We are, hopefully we have more people, people like you, you know, to talking about gender equality. We need um, yes, we <laughs> the participation and support of, of the, from men. Um, I, yes, I, I think the, as I just I kind of, it's, it's kind of answer the question, which is, uh, uh, unfortunately, they will be restricted um, because the government control. But on that hand, I think more people have, have become more aware of the issue. Um, I, uh, recently, I had a session uh, at a bookworm. One of my panelists is a young rapper. Uh, feminist rapper, she raps the issue. So I think there's a control, but more people become aware of that. For example, um, I mentioned that a few years, three years ago, the five feminists were arrested. And it's, um, because of that arrest, I mean, that was through media was controlled, but still more people uh, heard about that. So in the end, they, 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 the more people become aware of this issue and they, they become follow this um, the feminist uh, blog and so on. So I think, yeah, so I think that's uh, the overall trend that cannot be stopped. And also I think Chinese women are wonderful, so hardworking, so enterprising. For example, looking at uh, um, in business, uh, among the top 10 self-made uh, female, most successful female um, entrepreneurs, five come from China. I mean, they haven't, they haven't done greatly in politics because they haven't been given the opportunity. Yes, so fundamentally, women's rights are equal rights. Right? So for all the men sitting right here, uh, don't feel threatened by uh, us talking about uh, women's rights. Well, because women's rights or equal rights benefit both genders. So thank you again, Lydia. I think we are right on time. Uh, and the next session will be about uh, Shan Sa, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.